Hello. Our story begins on the Rishi Moon. It was a base not far from Kamino, meant to transmit a signal to Republic High Command, keeping the clone home world a safe haven from the war. It was one of the most important locations for the Republic War effort. The clones assigned to it were the Sergeant of the Base and the new batch of Shinies called the Domino Squad. Each of their members of course had their names, aside from the code numbers they were given at birth, which were Fives, Echo, Heavy, Cut Up, and Droid Bait. Currently, the one titled Droid Bait was outside the base when he saw a bunch of asteroids make their way for the moon. This wasn't the most uncommon thing, but it also wasn't the most common thing either. The issue with this little asteroid drop is Droid Bait remembered that Echo was reporting the news to the squad the other day. Typically, Droid Bait would just tune out his brother, but he happened to be listening, because in a way it did pertain to his role as deck officer. Essentially, there were reports that there was a new brand of battle droids, and they were commandos. They used unorthodox methods to land at their targets. Whichever method they used, they made sure that when they landed, they weren't an identifiable threat. The report wasn't taken seriously, but Droid Bait decided that it could be an issue here. He didn't have a weapon with him, so he quickly rerouted to the base and locked it up. This did seem a little paranoid at first, even to him, but he didn't want to risk anything, especially without protection. As he entered the base and made his way for the armory, the proximity alert began to blare. Sarge quickly told the boys to get to their weapons, and as they moved into the armory to get everything ready, they watched Sarge and a couple other clones get decimated before the new breed of battle droids made their way in. What resulted from this was a squad of clones evacuating through a vent and droid bait saving Cut-Up's life by blasting one of the Rishi eels that lived under the base. It was one of those one in a million shots by him, but it saved his brother. And following this event, Captain Rex and Commander Cody would assist the clone Chinese in recapturing the base and then defending it off from a droid invasion force. Despite the Domino Squad being fresh to combat, like veterans, they joined Rex and Cody in fighting for the base. Their work wasn't the best Rex or Cody had ever seen, but the fight was worth recognition. As the clones started to fall back, Heavy, Droid Bait, and Cut-Up worked with a gunk droid to try and tie it to charges for the entire base and then rig it to a detonator. It wasn't working too well at the moment, but thanks to Cody, Fives, Echo, and Rex, the clones were able to work together and desperately get everything ready to go. This led to the Domino Squad escaping out the hatches and blowing the Rishi Station to bits. Despite the loss of the base, it would be the heroic efforts that stopped the Separatists from invading Kamino. Obviously, the clone homeworld wouldn't be safe forever, but it was at the very least temporarily protected from the Separatists. Once the station was destroyed, a fleet arrived and scared off the Separatists. On top of that, the Domino Squad no longer had a place to be stationed, so Captain Rex brought them back to the Resolute and promoted them, adding them to Torrent Company within the 501st. They had proved themselves to be exceptional soldiers, and Rex couldn't think of any other men he would want serving alongside him on the front lines. For the Domino Squad, this was their big break. Of course, it was tragic they lost some brothers in the Rishi incident, but at least they had all their squad mates from Kamino. It was extremely rare for squad mates to enter the same division, company, or squad after leaving Kamino. It was even more rare for said squad, if together, to not lose one of its members after the first engagement. Fives and Echo still had their sights on the role of Arc Trooper, but the squad met with each other after being introduced to Commander Tano and General Skywalker. Heavy wanted to say something to each of his brothers. Firstly, he told them all that he's very proud of them. They had done a service to the galaxy, but they'd also face a lot more adversity. He told them that despite their loyalty to their brothers and their focus to the wider war around them, he wanted to make a pact. He and the rest of them understood how rare of an occurrence this was, and Heavy, especially, didn't want to lose these brothers. Heavy never told them that he almost deserted, and now that he hadn't, he was more loyal to their cause than ever before. So he suggested that this pact was one that they would make to protect each other, so that they would do everything within their own power to keep the others safe. Out of all the clones in Domino Squad, the only one who took up any sort of issue with this was Echo. He didn't have an issue issue, it was more of, he was concerned about the potential what-ifs that could happen. Like, if one of them was captured, would they disobey orders to save them? Or, if one of them was dying on the battlefield and there was no way to get to their side, what would they do? There were reasonable answers to each of Echo's concerns. Heavy and the rest of the squad then settled on their pact, and they integrated into the 501st. Their first combat missions would be very challenging. Despite being a part of the Torrent Company, which was arguably one of the most elite units in the Grand Army, they were also able to stay alive. 
most of this was because they were at the back of the line. They didn't have to eat the first barrage of blast or fire. What made this scenario interesting for them is they got to fight with other elite troopers, but also learn why they were doing so. It's what made the progress of Tor and company so continuous. Every time they needed new troopers, Rex would just do this with new recruits, just as a way to get them mentally prepared for what they might see. Rex and Anakin were uncanny with their strategies, and for the by-the-book clones, this could be hard to get behind. But part of the pact made by the Domino Squad included making sure that none of them fell behind. They wanted to stick together, and so that's exactly what they did. Initially, they didn't have the credentials to go off and do high-caliber missions, but they became trustworthy to Skywalker, Tano, and Rex. Domino Squad acted on a very tight regiment, one specifically designed by Echo, but it was created to help them stay at the top of their game. When they weren't on the battlefront, they would spend the first several hours of their day working on physical exercise. Didn't matter what it was, just something to keep them active. They would afterwards work on squad formations and tactical maneuvers that Rex used during previous battles, even ones they weren't a part of. Part of this was for the survival element of it, but the other part is they actively wanted to be the best within the Torrent Company. Rex and Anakin did know about this, but they didn't say anything about it. Rex would from time to time joke with the boys that they were coming for his position, and they loved the good little banter that was done with their captain. The biggest issue for them was when they had to sit through space battles. There were so many ground battles that the Torrent Company and 501st excelled at, but the Domino Squad hated having to remain idle when a space battle was going on. If it was simply a fleet battle like the one with the Malevolence, then they couldn't really do anything but wait. However, the Domino Squad got a chance to be excited about a fleet battle. A few short months after they joined the 501st, they were a part of a battle that took place in an asteroid field. The boys would join Rex and the men of Torrent Company, as they placed their ATTE walkers onto asteroids within the belt and used them to target the underbelly of the incoming Separatist fleet. Rex and the boys awaited for the moment and when the ships passed by, the trap was set. It was missions like this where Domino Squad thrived. They used these unorthodox methods to win the battle. Rex was very aware that Domino Squad welcomed these challenges and so, he decided that perhaps it was time to start giving them more chances to succeed. Rex was very hands-on with his troopers, and using them the best as he could, and so he made sure he could prop up his best troopers into his personal squad. He admired their dedication and their hard work. Rex knew that they would turn out as a benefit to not just their missions, but the individual clones themselves. He typically would keep a tally of each of the overachieving clones and make sure they were promoted accordingly. For the Domino Squad, they were able to identify themselves with their squad logo and the color of the 501st. Rex early on in the war encouraged his more elite units to wear colored armor. Originally this was Danal, but very quickly followed up by the Domino Squad. Heavy was the one who decided it'd be cool to lay artwork of Dominos on the side of their helmets, with a blue stripe down the middle of the artwork itself. Their armor was all custom to their own unique style. For example, Echo still had a blue handprint on his chest, and Heavy placed a rotator cannon piece on his chest and so on. The stripes and markings on their armor were all different from each other but the Domino Squad on the side of their helmets were the key identifier that they were the Domino Squad. While they were referred to as the Domino Squad, they were fully a part of the 501st, but they still, in their own opinions, weren't living up to the standard they set out to live up to. Fives continued pushing the ARC Trooper narrative and they all bought into it, but they were all a long ways away from becoming ARC Troopers. No matter the conflict they fought at and the number of victories they achieved, they weren't ARC Troopers because, as a unit, they may have been elite, but they were also a part of something more than just themselves. Despite the Domino Squad buying into the Arc Trooper mentality, they weren't chasing it to be better than their brothers. It was a goal they had underneath their camaraderie for the men of the 501st. They continued seeing conflicts arise at Ryloth with Cad Bane, the Second Battle Genosis, and Seleucami. But their bravery as a squad would be tested most at the Battle of Kamino. It would be the place where Heavy could reconnect with 99 and have his medal returned to him. Obviously, Heavy didn't want it back. If it weren't for 99, he would have never become a trooper in the Grand Army of the Republic. The attack that came at Kamino was one that was difficult to deal with, but the Domino Squad was dispatched on a secret mission to deal with an incoming attack from the far side of Topoka City. It was five clones versus an army of battle droids. The Aqua droids were very similar in size and strength to super battle droids, which made their fight even more difficult. But with Heavy leading the charge, the Domino Squad banded together and fought off the incoming Separatists. 
With a rotator cannon at the ready and four more weapons firing down at them, the dominoes were impenetrable, or at least they seemed to be that way as more battle droids started to ambush them from the sides. A grenade did the job when it came to dealing with those bundle of droids, and what remained was the final little surprise, a bundle of clone cadets that had been separated from their instructors. They were on the run because nowhere in the city was safe. Without anyone to lead them, Heavy knew this was his chance to shine, and so he took a hold of the reins, telling the boys that they were one and the same. They'd be able to defend their home and take down these attackers. What followed was a brilliantly executed plan to push the Separatists away from Kamino. They were fighting off bundles of attackers, but with three Jedi Generals present, Cody and Rex, there was no way the clones wouldn't win. Inside the city, as General Kenobi engaged Grievous, the Domino Squad, now escorted by Cody and Rex, were using themselves and clone cadets to ambush the Separatist marching party. But no matter what Domino Squad did, they wouldn't be able to save their brother from an unnerving death. At the end of the day, 99 was just like them, a soldier. The Domino Squad would be recognized for their work during the Battle of Kamino. It was understood that they were five against an army, and if it hadn't been for them, then they could have been more casualties and at that, the potential of a loss on Kamino. Who knows what those hundreds of battle droids could have done had they broken free. This increase in ranking was a huge honor for the boys of the Domino Squad, but something else remained. They would now hold more responsibilities than ever before. They, as ARC Troopers, were leaders, and despite new upgrades to their armor, new weapons, and greater responsibilities, they all accepted the challenge with open arms. However, Captain Rex saw a great amount of potential in this unit. It was uncommon to have so many ARC Troopers roaming around a division or company, but the fact that these clones were from around the same squad made them even more special. Rex proposed to General Skywalker that these clones be allowed to run missions with Commander Tano alone. It would allow both Ahsoka and the Dominus to get much needed practice, while also become a commando unit without the actual need for commandos. Anakin initially wasn't sure about the idea, but after thinking it through and seeing mostly only positives from this, he accepted the idea. The Dominus, which Ahsoka was now being lumped into, wasn't just a commando unit, but they were to slowly integrate into the eyes and ears of the founder first. Essentially, Rex and Anakin would make sure they could function properly under even more stress than they were used to, and if they could, then they would become an elite sect of the founder first. Skywalker didn't want them to be separated from the rest of the men, but he did want them to use more unorthodox methods. If they could even the odds for the 501st or even help them get the upper hand in a low odds success mission, then they could continue pushing out victories at a faster rate than they already were. It was agreed upon and the Dominus very quickly were given their first mission. Initially, Anakin and Rex wanted to give the six of them a relatively easy mission, but that didn't happen. Instead, they were thrown to the wolves and forced to fend for themselves. The mission was simple, succeeding it was not. They were to land on the surface of a planet, disable the shield generator for the Separatist base, and then steal a Separatist shuttle and land inside a flagship and make it go boom boom. Very simple, very easy to understand. Accomplishing it would be very difficult, but they had Commander Tano. How bad could it be? They jumped the hyperspace and took the shuttle to the surface of the planet and split up. Ahsoka and Echo went down the left side. Heavy and Fives down the middle, and Droid Bait and Cut Up on the far right. This was meant to simply pull distractions if anything was triggered and get the attention of the droids away from anyone else. Droid Bait and Cut Up went to the side of the fort, and they followed some droids in and snuck behind some containers. At the same time, Ahsoka used the force to help Echo get up the side of the wall. Meanwhile, Heavy and Fives were in the bushes, watching a patrol of 30 droids march down their direction. It was very tempting, especially for Heavy, to wipe these droids out, but it wouldn't serve them any purpose. Heavy was convinced that they could be responsible for killing one of their brothers once the invasion starts. Fives agreed, and so they laid some traps for the droids, essentially a couple sticky imploders so that once they were in the clear, they could blow up the droids. It was a very delicate maneuver, but they were able to stick these grenades to the back of the line so they could continue to be undetected. Droid bait and cut up were in the worst position. They were stuck between battle droids moving around. However, they were the closest to the vessel. They then spotted Ahsoka and Echo moving about and decided that it was time to get to the shuttle. The commander and Echo moved into the command station and quietly took down the battle droids, and then they realized that the Separatists had a plan for the Republic. They knew there was an attack coming. Ahsoka looked to Echo and told him to inform Heavy and Fives to get out of here so they could warn the fleet. Echo nodded and quickly moved out of the command room. 
doing everything he could to avoid detection. Ahsoka knew that the four of them could finish the mission, but they couldn't afford to not warn the fleet. Echo hid behind some ramparts as he made his way to the front of the base, where Heavy and Five still were. The two of them were still laying low, just making sure no one was coming. As they kept their eyes on the fortress walls, they could see Echo gesture his hands. He gave them hand signals to get back to the ship and inform the Republic of something. They may have been all super close, but no one knew the hand signals like Echo and Kata. Everyone knew them well, but Heavy had the hardest time with them. From what Fives could tell is that they were leaving to inform the Republic that it was a trap. They turned and booked it through the forest, getting back to the ship and leaving. At the same time, Ahsoka layered detonators across the shield generator controls and abandoned the command center so that she could join Echo, Cut Up, and Dreadbait inside the Separatist shuttle. Once they were all together, she disclosed that they needed to act fast. Chances are, Anakin and the fleet were already in hyperspace. She knew how Anakin worked at this point. He would give her half an hour from the point they turned off their long-range communication frequency before jumping to hyperspace. It had been that amount of time and he was on the way now. She just thought that sending Heavy and Fives would be the best way to ensure, if they failed, that the fleet wasn't in danger or surprised. The three clones informed her that they wouldn't fail, and she smiled sitting down at the controls and getting ready to lift off. When they got their chance to leave, they did, making their way for the flagship. There had been rumors of Admiral Trench's return since his apparent death at Christophsis, but no one knew for sure. Truthfully, the 501st wasn't supposed to be here. The only reason they were is because Anakin had the special forces that could complete the mission. If there were only two ARC troopers, he never would have sanctioned the mission to begin with. Speaking of Skywalker, he and Admiral Yularn received a communication from the system they were currently en route to. Yularn was fuming because he knew they should have waited for the mission to be confirmed as complete, but Anakin insisted they go anyways. There was a point to both ends. Anakin just believed everything would work out perfectly, and that alone irked Yularn more than anything else. In the middle of the Separatist fleet, the four remaining Dominoes exited their Separatist shuttle and quickly made their way through the halls of the vessel. They didn't have time to sneak around and avoid battle droids, so they caused a ruckus. The clones tore down the droids with Ahsoka leading the charge, blocking all potentially dangerous shots. As they continued pressing through the ship, everything got more difficult, which they did expect considering it was a ship after all. But they were able to quickly get into the ship's mainframe and twist the wires. Everything was misconstrued now. As Cut Up and Droid Bait were siphoning through the wires to make sure they had enough time to escape the capital ship and get out of the explosion radius, Ahsoka told Echo to detonate the base on the ground, so he didn't, which caused Admiral Trench to direct focus to the base to stop whatever was happening down there. He was still loading up forces in the hangar base to make sure that if anyone was going to try and escape, that they couldn't and wouldn't have any luck. Trench knew how this game would go, but he was expecting an EMP burst, and despite the clones being humans, an EMP burst in a ship like this would affect them badly. Trench assumed EMP because it would disable their fleet near the flagship. Regardless, the clones got the correct combination and it gave them 5 minutes of leeway. Ahsoka told them that they would only need 3, as she and the troopers rushed out of the circuitry control room and ran for the hangar bay. They met very little resistance along the way, which made them worry about how they were actually going to escape, especially if Trench rerouted all the forces to the hangar bay. Ahsoka had a funny feeling, and so she told the clones to keep going, and she'd take a page out of Master Kenobi's manual. The clones had no issue with this. They were fully capable, so they pressed forward. When they got to the hangar bay, they saw nothing but battle droids. So many that they couldn't even see their shuttle. Droid Bay panicked, and suggested that they fix the wires so they would have more time to escape. Echo denied this idea, and said they could do it. Cut Up noted that Ahsoka made it to the catwalk over the hangar bay. She could potentially make something happen, but she then realized that she didn't know what she was doing. Maybe she was in over her head here. She looked down and saw the clones looking at her. They were all ready and waiting her move. She took a deep breath and looked around. Perhaps there was something that she could do. Maybe, maybe, maybe. She then looked up above her head and noticed that there were offline vulture droids in the ceiling. Perhaps she could unlock their metallic feet and let them drop. She ran across the catwalk and found a control console. Her fingers quickly traced the screen to find a potential code for knocking them off the position, and then she found it. Only downside is it could turn them online. Well, they'd cross that bridge when they got there. Echo informed her that they were working with a minute and 30 seconds. 
They needed to get this going or they'd all be dead. Ahsoka shoved the lever down and watched dozens of vulture droids drop from the ceiling. She then saw something else. And as they were falling, she threw her lightsaber down one end of the catwalk and caught it on the other end, before slamming her blade into the ground and dragging it across. As the vulture droids crushed other battle droids, she was able to cut the catwalk off of its bolts and screws, allowing it to free fall. But because most of the damage was on her side of the catwalk, it crashed down in a huge wave, ripping through entire lines of battle droids. The clones saw no better opportunity, as Cut Up jokingly said, they could use more explosives. Droid Bait had an idea, tossing some droid poppers to his brothers and telling them to throw them. He remembered seeing something an elite unit of troopers did. He blasted the mini EMP bursts and watched it descend onto the droids, incapacitating them. They continued firing forward as they watched a couple of the vulture droids activate again. The clones caught up with Ahsoka as she led them towards their ship, which was luckily undamaged by the free-falling vulture droids. But there were some battle droids that had differing opinions on the condition of the ship. Wrist rockets were fired and Ahsoka stopped, knowing that if the shuttle was clipped, they would all die. She used the force to repel the rocket into the head of a vulture droid before following the clones into the ship, where Echo lifted off and flew out of the hangar bay. As they left the capital ship, it exploded. Inside were a bundle of explosives that were meant to be used as mines for corvettes and light cruisers during the actual battle that was supposed to commence. And they worked entirely against Admiral Trench and doomed him again to an explosion and fire. The blast ripped out and destroyed some support vessels. As it did, the Dominoes were able to escape the rest of the fleet, which was disorganized and waited for their reinforcements, which came very quickly. Anakin was informed by their success, and by the time they arrived, he could cockily tell Admiral Yularen, I told you so, which was very openly despised. The success of the Domino Squad would be recognized by Rex and General Skywalker. It was a much more challenging mission than it was originally supposed to be, but as the war continued on, their missions would vary between more difficult and not as much. The Dominoes were extremely successful and they had only one bad mission, which was a Citadel mission. The explosion that rocked Echo looked to be deadly, but the other members were able to quickly find him in the blast wreckage and carry him. It wasn't an easy mission as it was, but his helmet was ripped in half and he was struggling to breathe. Thanks to the wisdom of Jedi Master Even Peel, he was able to comfort Echo and perform a little bit of a force heal on his wounded body. It would be this very simple and selfless action that would save Echo's life while they were still here at the Citadel. When they escaped the planet with the help of Plo Koon and Stacey Tin, the Dominoes would have themselves a conversation about the events that happened. Echo wasn't present for this because he was still in a back to tank, but the clones honestly expressed their fondness of the Jedi. They never had any fears of anything happening to the Jedi, but this was the most recent example of them doing something mystical to save their friend's life or one of them. The Dominoes felt as if they owed everything to the Jedi for having saved not just them, but their brothers across the galaxy a number of times. In the following months, the Dominoes would lose a key member to their squad. It would be a loss that sent a rupture through their hearts and broke them in their very barracks. Commander Tana was removed from the Jedi Order, and on top of that, she decided that she wouldn't ever be returning to the Jedi. General Skywalker informed the Dominoes first, being that they were so close to her. They knew that without her, they wouldn't have survived many of their missions, and now, they felt like they wouldn't be able to continue without her friendship and guidance. She was obviously much more than a military leader to them. She may have been their commander, but she was also their best friend, their sister if you will, and now she was gone. On the bright side, she wasn't dead, but there was also a very visible hole in the hearts of the Domino Squad. But as soldiers, they must pick themselves up and continue forward. Echo by this point had fully recovered and aside from minor surgery on his body, he was operating at a very functional level. Regardless, the unit fought on, and near the end of the war, they found themselves alongside Skywalker and Rex, trapped inside an LAAT shot down from the sky. When they crashed, the clones very quickly got up and rushed out, following Anakin as he led the men in a frontal assault. Inside the ship, Cut Up struggled to get up. It's not like this was the first time this happened to them. The Domino Squad had gone through dozens of gunships in their time, so surviving a crash wasn't the most uncommon thing for them. Cut Up rubbed his head as Fives pulled him up and asked if he was alright. He nodded his head and shook off whatever was happening. Fives pushed ahead to catch up with the rest of the troopers. As Cut Up continued moving forward, Kix came up and asked if everything was alright, and he again non-verbally nodded his head. His focus then became Anakin Skywalker. 
He was a Jedi. The Jedi needed to die. Cut up Brace's blaster and shot. The shot went past Jesse, Rex, Fives, Dreadbait, Echo, and Heavy, clipping Anakin on his dominant shoulder as he tripped over something, being simply surprised by being shot in the back. The other clones turned around and Kix very quickly tackled his brother, trying to stop him. But Cut Up wasn't going to be manhandled. He had a job to finish. He resisted until he was stunned. When Cut Up actually woke up, he was inside of a Kaminoan facility, with his squad mates beside him. The battle was won and the Republic didn't require any more reinforcements, so the rest of the Domino Squad and Captain Rex could be present. They were simply monitoring Cut Up, but the Kaminoans wished to do tests on the rest of the clones present. Rex wasn't on board with it, but he accepted the tests that they were put through. The Dominoes really struggled with why Cut Up would target a Jedi or have a vendetta against him, especially Skywalker. Fives was beginning to see that something was going on with Nala Say and Cut Up, so he began digging, and the other members of Domino Squad realized that Fives was doing something odd. Why would he be digging? But it seemed like there was something deeper going on, anyways. The plot continued to thicken, but they were out of the loop. Fives headlined the entire thing, and he eventually got to the point where he was able to get the inhibitor chip out of Cut-Up's head, and when everything seemed like it would fizzle out into chaos, the removal of Cut-Up's inhibitor chip is what inevitably saved him, which meant that for Shock T, there was something going on here. Due to the Jedi believing the clones, and the Kaminoans looking bad, Palpatine dispatched a unit of assassin clones from Mount Tantus. He was going to quote unquote suggest that these were clones without their inhibitor chips, which in a way could be true because all they were were conditioned monsters. They were supposed to be killing machines, and Palpatine sent them to Tavoka City at the risk of exposing everything, just so the clones wouldn't ever speak about Order 66 or the inhibitor chips. Shock T was set to bring Rex and the Dominoes to Coruscant so they could meet with the Jedi Council. Nala Se was holding out because she wanted the clones to meet Palpatine, however, Shakti had no intention of allowing Nala Se to get away with this, so instead of dispatching the clones to Coruscant, she requested the available masters to Kamino. This included Yoda, Oppo, Ceci, and Fisto. It would take them longer than it would for the assassin clones to arrive. The terrifying aspect about these assassins is they blended in. They weren't wearing their specialized armor, and they looked just like regular Phase 2 clones. When night fell onto Boca City, the Domino Squad was up with Cut Up in his room. They didn't want anyone coming near him. Outside the room was an armed guard. Everyone was on high alert in this area of the city. And this guard was stationed by Shock T. Inside the room, they were playing a game of Sabak to pass the time. In the corner of the room, Fives was sleeping. The other three would take their turns later. As they were playing, the two guards outside the room were attacked and killed discreetly. Due to Lamasu, all the security in the city was cut off, and the Kaminoans were monitoring everything as to make sure it could all be covered up. The assassin clones blew into the room after taking out the guard and instantly, the Domino Squad got to their feet and defended themselves, but they were tired and not armed. The clones got into a brawl the second hostilities were shown. The assassins tried to fire, but the second they burst into the room they were ambushed. It was an all out fight, and as the noise rattled throughout the room, Fives got up and joined his brothers. Cut Up was still lifelessly silent on the bed. The clone assassins were such a surprise to the dominoes that they were actually struggling, despite them not even doing their best. Not to mention that they were outnumbered. They were fighting a squad of 12 with a squad of 4 barely awake. The dominoes pulled together and used each other to pin the other clones against the walls and use low blows to take an advantage. They needed to stall until Shock T arrived, as Fives tapped a button on his communication device to inform her if something happened. The brawl continued on with members of Domino Squad falling, and then Droid Bay got a blaster and used it to stun one, two, three, oops, that was heavy. He got four clones, but it lessened their own odds before he was kicked over a table and knocked out. As the fight continued, Shakti arrived and ignited her lightsaber. When she did, one of the clones grabbed a weapon and shot at her, only for her to back out of the room and use a force to bring the assassins out of the room too. But there was one missing the one who was currently shaking the mannequin. They thought they caught him, but Rex was informed by the clone commander of the city that an unidentified vessel landed on the docks. Rex thought this was odd and decided to conspire with Shock Team, which she was okay with. They were all ready for this, and at this current moment, Cut Up was closing in on Coruscant. Nalase had no clue, and Shock T worked very diligently to keep everything under the wraps. 
because despite Shock T telling the council about cut up with Nala Se next to her, she used hand symbols to inform them that there was something going on here in Tokoka City. This allowed the Jedi to use everything they had to prepare cut up and Rex. Their arrival coincided with the interrogation of the assassin troopers in Tapoka City, but instead of answers, they watched 12 clones commit self-die by biting on an electrical burst in their mouth. On Coruscant, the Jedi were given all the information the clones received, and at that, they learned of the developments of Tapoka City. They decided that instead of allowing the Domino Squad out of their sight, they'd be kept right here on Coruscant. The following few weeks would be extremely strenuous and tense, not just for the Jedi and Kaminoans, but for Palpatine. He didn't know what the Jedi had or didn't have. He was also actively trying to split the Council up. He knew that the Jedi Council could defend the Order from Order 66. Currently, none of their members were on world. He couldn't get away with murder, as it were. He did work hard to make sure there was something that could pull the Jedi away, but nothing actually did the job. They continued gifting the task to other Jedi within the Order. So while it did separate the Jedi and spread them out, it wasn't like it was the best of the best of the Order. The Jedi had been going through the inhibitor chips to try and find the cause of these chips. It was clear the Kaminoans were behind it, and they were curious as to what their intentions were. What was also occurring at the same time was the discovery of Silman on Obadia. And because Palpatine was doing damage control with the clones and Dooku was trying to cover up his involvement, the Jedi were able to bring Silman back to the temple which only added to the plot, and so the Jedi, thanks to the information from both Soman and the Domino Squad, were able to release everything to the Senate and inform them of the plot behind the war. Inevitably, this brought the war crashing down to an end. Dooku was exposed, and he had one choice, expose the full truth or die, and so he exposed Palpatine. He knew this plan failed, and the Sith were frauds. He'd rather go out with a little bit of honor than die loyal to a cause that betrayed him a number of times over the past 12 years. It wouldn't save Dooku from himself or his own actions, but he could at the very least live knowing that he did something right. He would be bombed by Palpatine before he could ever be brought to justice. What followed was a crazy witch hunt across the galaxy, after Palpatine executed a number of executive orders. These included 65, 66, and 99. Palpatine at the end of this hunt would be caught and killed. This turned the galaxy into a state of chaos, but luckily, the clones for the most part had removed their inhibitor chips. It wasn't galaxy-wide, but it was enough to reduce casualties to a super high level. The addition of Order 65 allowed the Senate to feel the wrath of their own complacency. While the mess that unfolded across the galaxy was nightmarish, it did stop the Empire from rising. It turned the Sith against each other, and it would be the end of the Clone Wars era. Though the final battle of the Clone Wars would come with the Domino Squad, finally reuniting with their best friend Ahsoka Tano on Mandalore, where they would be instrumental in stopping the birth of a criminal empire. The Domino Squad would eventually be remembered as the clone unit responsible for stopping so much unknown. And while they would accept their gratitude with humility, there was a part of them that wondered what came next. They had the life of victors, but they were still soldiers. What followed the war would be a miniature war in the Outer Rim, one completed by the clones who were receiving their own freedom from the military once they won this war. This came with numerous benefits. The Domino Squad took those benefits, but realized they didn't know what to do with themselves. So, they found a place to figure it all out. Instead of focusing on the warrior past they had, the five brothers would open up a bar on Coruscant with all their pension money. It would build them the lives they desired after the war came to an end. Each brother actually going on to have their own fulfillment in life. For some of them, this became a married life under the clone act of 1ACW after Clone Wars, or simply managing the new bar and having fun. All that mattered in the end, to them, is they were the lucky ones. Cut up was a one in a million survivor, as were the rest of them, all survivors of the terrible era that had finally come to its end. And that, my friends, is our clone story. Again, special thanks to Benjamin Wells, Jango Fett Clone, Ben Ingram, The Big Red Pure Mark, Diamond Constant, Darth Nemesis, Lord Tibbs, CC2024, Galvin Gaming, Tristan Mandalore, Sir William1767, Darth Revan, Grandity Bane, Laliant, Sky Guy, Penguin, Cullen Rooney, Shark Midori, RJ38, Nick, Michael Erlanger, The Last Jedi, Apollo, We Was Yosemite, Anakin Shank Runner, CT7567, Toaster Oven, Oz of Oz, Darth Knox, The Eternal Padawan, Joshua Tem, Johnny Daguin, Sith Skeleton, Jedi Sloth, Mr. Yeet Gamer, Lord Cali, Gunless A66, Mammoth Studios, Anakin 003, Lord Draken, Forza Star Wars, 
Airbus, Rex Wolf, Man 3 First Names, Dark Saint 46, Baron Joshua, and Luke Denwing. For supporting the channel, smash that like button. If you want to support me in other ways, go check out the Patreon, super cool things on there. Otherwise, let's talk about the story. Telling a story with the clones being the main focus is always very interesting, but taking a squad of clones and making them the main priority, kind of like we do with Bad Batch videos, is also fun. Especially because this one is a group of clones that we haven't seen really develop past two episodes of The Clone Wars. And so, it was hard to kind of mix both the small scale of a squad and their life together with the large scale of what their effect can be on the galaxy. I wanted to incorporate what Fives had to go through with Tup, but also change it up so it's not just with Tup and repeating the same thing over, but instead with Cut Up and have the clones, especially in this unit, to have a really big love for the Jedi, which is why they could never believe that there'd be any rationale behind his decisions of doing it. So, anyways, I hope you all enjoyed. I love you all, spread the love, and always remember my friends, may the Force be with you.